announcements and all kinds of questions. And just because you asked him a question didn't mean he was going to answer you, or me for that matter. And when he did, sometimes he even answered as like, are you sure that you can handle this? I wish this? I could free your thoughts. You remind me of a log jam. You got all kinds of logs, thoughts, all jammed up and twisted around. I tried to say, but to change one thought, the whole log jam began to move, and it could get worse. Easy. I wasn't ever out to get Charlie. I was just actually curious about all kinds of things, so I asked him all kinds of questions. And he's one of those criminals. If if he find, if he thinks that you're like a little too much like him, or you're trying to get a little too close to him, he might cut away from you. If you get too close, I'll just send you away. However, I can. I feel you are me, but you may not know it. If you knew it, you wouldn't bother me with playing you to me. But if he does trust you, just like all criminals, they want to be profiled. All of them. They want to tell what they did. They don't want to die and leave that a secret. So sometimes Manson would tell me things. Tell me things like, hey, how can I join the Manson family? Would I have been a good candidate for this Manson family? Would you have let me join? And then I would get answers back. And some of these answers may come in. Like I, like I say, Manson, uh, I like to say Manson speaks in Bible. He speaks in parables. He speaks in comparisons. And sometimes even speaks in code. So you have to look at things real close on what Charlie's saying, especially when I would ask him questions, because sometimes he was revealing secrets to me, and I would have never known if I wouldn't have seen this little code. Or sometimes it, it was just hidden in plain sight. You just had to figure it out. And this is one of those, and we'll go through it, we'll look and see if I could have actually joined the Manson family. Well, I've been a good candidate. What you give up to is giving up to me. What you work to make to, I've almost got it won. Dog heads are under my wolf head at the ranch. I left it in your dog's head. But that's one L-I-I-I-L-E chamber of fear, lies, and confusion I left like an old cigar butt on the railroad track. Everyone that outsmarts me ends up in the Morrow's house of Georgetown as a gob of snot. My side of the box is larger. In this holy soul of sons, sons love Atwa. Your life is all life and much more beyond some. Don't sweat the little things at all. So what could have been read as that's one little chamber of fear, thinking maybe that he forgot to cross his T's, but if you look at all the T's on here, none of them are uncrossed, and the T's don't even look like that. So that's part of the code I was said he was talking in. So if you could just glance right over that and think, oh, that's a little chamber, but no, he was talking about sociotypes there. And down even further, he was talking about a guy from Georgetown a guy who taught history at Georgetown, but he wrote books under a pseudonym, and the books that he wrote were about history, but they were fiction. So that's sort of like a, a play on Bugliosi down there. And so Manson was pretty well read. This goes from like Marx and Freud to Georgetown University. Manson, he kept his eye open, and it was really into sociotypes in sociology. And the Manson family, family really was created on sociology. Only the perfect types could fit. Otherwise, you have to go because you would cause some conflict in the whole structure. Have you ever listened to the girls talk when they talk about how Manson met them, most of them? All the stories sound familiar. They all sound similar. And they all sound like magic in a way. No, Manson just shows up and he magically does something that makes me feel happy. Each and every story, from when Blue said she had a tracheotomy scar, Manson walks up, circles the scar, and tells her, your mom tried to kill you. And she's like, my mom did try to kill me. And Charlie, upon meeting me, knew this. And he said, you are strong. He said, you're strong. And another thing he said, one of the first things he said, you think too much. 
He said, you got to quit, th- quit thinking. And I said, I have, to th- I have to think about that. He didn't see me until he got close enough. He said something, and then he, he said, so your father kicked you out. And it was amazing to me. Um, we slept together, and I felt... I felt really loved by him. When we made love, all I remember is just crying and crying to this man because he said, oh, you're beautiful. I couldn't believe that. I just started crying. You didn't believe that you were? Oh, absolutely not. And then he would look at you and smile with somehow, I felt like, oh, I'm a part of it. It was um, so wonderful that it scared us. But it easily became familiar in us is somehow nurtured and brought out and brought forth you know it didn't happen overnight he spent a lot of time taking the middle class girls and remolding them stop you during the day and you'd put your palms up to his and then he'd move them in any direction that he could or he'd make a series of faces and then you were supposed to try to keep up with them and the whole thing was always geared toward um, just complete mirroring of, of him. Sometimes he would reenact the crucifixion when we were on LSD. And it was very realistic. Um, would you die for me? Did you ask them to die for you? Would they die? Sure, for you? sure. My friends went all the way to the gas chamber to death row to, for brother, for love of brother, to stop the war, and for a lot of the causes that other people were espousing in those times. When we were for real, and we did do it in the road and all those things, all the people that were saying they wanted to stop the war and revolution and all that, they turned their backs on us and went to the bank or the school or or whatever. They were fakes and frauds. Jane Fonda, Joan Baez, all Tom Hayden, all that scum were faking. And they were they were getting the kids, they were instigating the youth to do these things. And they were making money off of it. It's the same, it's it's still happening. You got people selling crime and violence and causes and and whatever, and all they're really doing is making money. But the young with the heart and the soul and the care, they go out and do something for real, and then people point their finger and call them evil, bad, nasty, and crazy, and drug-soaked, and all these things. It's an original poster from the Chicago 7 when they were visiting UCLA. You know, Rennie Davis, Jerry Rubin, Abby Hoffman, Tom Hayden. Them are some of the people that Sandra Good was talking about. These are some of the people that entice the kids to rise up, overthrow the government. They didn't like what was going on. They were the one that was protesting in the streets. They're the ones influencing the minds. There was a social project going on there. It was a social experiment happening all over the place here in California. And this was one of them. These people here, the Jane Fondas of the world, enticing people to rise up. Some of these kids were listening, just like Sandra Good said. They're listening. Just as I said many, many, many videos ago, if somebody tries to tell you about your, you, they're usually telling you about themselves. And when they say Manson was mani- trying to manipulate these people's minds, that was the government. They were trying to do that. And they were feeding information into this case down the line to show that, hey, this was Manson that was trying to manipulate people's minds, not us. But Manson wasn't manipulating anybody's minds. The reason he would even use the sociology is he was a pimp. He was trying to pick the right chicks, you know? That's what I'd all played into. You know, if you're into one of those personality types like the the I-L-E or the L-I-I, you were probably perceptible for Manson and his pimp operation or also this Manson family gig that he had going on. But this Manson family gig, where did it even start? LLIs, 
that sort of type, that social type, which some of the traits of it are over here, but it also has the traits of a person who don't really, they don't use historical events, past historical events, for any kind of direction for the future. They care more internally about their own feelings and emotions than they care about the outside. Some of those things go along with this type too. There's a test that you can take online to find out your own sociotype. And if you fall into one of these two categories, you could have been, you know, good makings for the Manson family. An, an ILE, besides having the traits also over here, it also doesn't have a problem with speaking up. When society sets rules, rules that are imposed on them and on how they feel about them rules that are imposed on them. So them are just some of the, you can go through a long, it, it's, it's a study in this. You know, this is just a brief, we're just doing a brief, like 15 minutes of sociology here, but you can get into a huge study of it. But Manson tells basically in these postcards that I'm not a worthy, I'm not a worthy candidate for the Manson family. It's more it's, of, and if you were going to pick a, a sociotype for Manson, he would probably fall under the, ironically enough, the L-I-E, the lie sociotype. Check them all out and see what you think. But there was a big social experiment going on here. It was going on within the government with them handing people LSD, which we already went over. I don't think you know, Manson was involved in any MK Ultra. He might have been getting his free LSDs because he sure had enough of it for some reason, who knows, still haven't rolled that part out yet where he got all this LSD from and all this marijuana from since there was no marijuana in 1969 except for Manson, he was handing it out to everybody. There was also a, there was a, Manson, this, this, these videos are not really for me to tell you anything, any kind of discovery. All they are is for you to maybe discover yourself, do you still believe in this Helter Skelter? bullshit because here's something else I want to show you before we end this big social experiment that was going on here you know Manson how he gets he's getting out of Terminal Island again now we're back in 1967 and they say he doesn't want out they say he does not want out and again I asked him that question and remember what his answer was then his out of what and into what so and now if we look at the paperwork, and these are all from the public archives and public records here, um, we'll look at his paperwork when he gets out of Terminal Island, and he's headed to either Los Angeles, which he did to find Lynette from, uh, or if he's headed to San Francisco, they give him a choice. You know, either you head, stay in Los Angeles and you meet here at this parole office, or you go to San Francisco and you meet with the undersigned. I don't know what the undersigned is because it's not part of this document, but I'm only guessing that the undersigned could have been maybe his parole officer, which was a guy by the name of Roger Smith. Roger Smith opened up a drug facility, treatment facility, inside of a free clinic, hate Ashbury district of San Francisco. So Manson's headed there to see this guy now. This is where he lives. This is where they sent the paperwork to anyway, this address in San Francisco that I've never even heard of before. This is where the story gets funny though, because this is, this again, this is a whole experiment with society. Their experiment, somebody's experiment with society, Manson's experiment with society, you see he's picking sociotypes, but really he's only picking those because going back to the prostitution days, man, he knows a lot about sociotypes, so it's not Manson that's behind all this shit. He may look like it at times, and he even may look magical at times, but he ain't. Everything, everything, Everything's a puzzle that sort of fits together somehow, this big social experiment that was going on. Um, what I want to know is, okay, they give Manson a choice to go to San Francisco. He goes to San Francisco, he meets up with his parole officer, this Mr. Smith guy, Roger Smith. Hmm. 
Well, in this paperwork, they mail it to both places, one in Los Angeles, one in uh, San Francisco, wherever Manson's going to be. That's where he can get his paperwork at. Uh, okay, he, he, we all know he went to San Francisco. First, he picked up Lynette Fromm on the way, but he went to San Francisco. When he got to San Francisco, he magically picked up Lynette Fromm on the way, you know. Oh, Manson, oh, you knew I ran away. How did he know all this shit? Um, okay, he picks her up, headed to San Francisco now. And when he gets to San Francisco, uh, he's supposed to check in with this parole guy, Roger Smith, who runs a drug treatment facility inside the free clinic that a guy by the name of Dr. David Smith opened up. It's the Smith family, Robinson, going on here, because now we got two Smiths, what a common name that is, and one of them is working for the other one. And the David Smith, who opened up this free clinic in San Francisco, eventually would write an essay about the Manson family that was, uh, it was written about in some book. But it, you can find the essay. It was on it was Dr. Smith essay on the Manson family. It looks like on communes and things like that. Uh, what the hell were they doing this for? Why were they writing an essay on Charles Manson before he ever was Charles Manson? Or were they? They say they were, but were they? Maybe they were writing it after the fact. Maybe they wrote, this is what we observed after the fact, after they needed this information for this trial that they had going on. I don't know how it went, but there was an essay that was put out about Charles Manson by this guy, Dr. David Smith. But it wasn't, it wasn't authorized by the Manson family. It was done on the sneak. It was done behind their backs, you know? They didn't even know this was going on. So who authorized this damn shit? Because the United States government's the one that sent Manson up to San Francisco to a drug treatment facility where he's never been involved in drugs in his damn life before um, to meet up with a Smith to go work at another facility with another Smith. This all just sounds strange to me. The whole thing, that's why I say these videos aren't really to tell you any answers. They're just to open up your mind a little bit more and maybe point out some things that I can flash along the way on the screen so you can think, wow, that don't make no sense. Okay, let's get back to this whole social experiment that's going on. Did this Smith guy write this essay before the fact or after the fact? Was it written to accommodate this Manson character that they wanted to create after the fact? Or did he honestly write it before the fact and do some essay on hippies in the commune? I don't really know because of when you look at the whole big picture of everything, nothing makes sense. Nothing at all makes sense. No say, sense makes sense, they say. Well, here's another thing that doesn't make no sense to me. When they sent Manson the paperwork in 1967 from the public archives here, when they sent Manson this paperwork from these public archives that we're all looking at, that was this created before or after? Hell, it looks like it might have been done after the fact to me. Either that or they had a good tarot reader or they were some Spengali, or they were Nostradamus, because these paperwork is sent to a place in San Francisco that we've never heard of before. And it's also sent to an address here in Los Angeles, Dennis Wilson's house. He didn't even know Dennis Wilson then. So how did they know Dennis Wilson then? Was this stuff written before or after? And if it was written after, why would it look like they're sending it to Manson to tell him to report somewhere. Huh? The addresses don't make no sense in this timeline of Helder's Gelder. Anyway, that's about it. Didn't mean to give you a whole class in sociology, but it kind of boils down to that with Manson sometimes. You never can tell where his mind's going. And he was always thinking it'll bit sociology, you know? Sometimes it was like um, sociology to fit his own circumstance. Like this. He's sitting in a cell. Most of the time he's sitting in solitary confinement. Solitary conf confinement has been proven to break a man. It's been bust him down. His mind goes away. But not Manson. Because Manson thinks of society and society's problems in his brain. 
And when he's thinking about being in the hole all by himself, how that's breaking him down, all he has to do is think about another sociological place in time, in society, when he is in a way better spot in this cell by himself than he ever would have been in this place, in history, in society. That all has to do with this whole big social experiment we're all involved in. It's called social media. It's called YouTube. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. And until next time, we'll see you. I want you to give this question a lot of consideration. You don't have to answer me now. But can you imagine what it would be like to be interrogated by the SS? There's no doubt about it, is there?